It's not every day on Capitol Hill you see a panel that's truly bipartisan, and especially when it comes to issues like contraception. Even though birth control is so widely used and so effective and just important to women's economic empowerment, there, it remains very polarized on the Hill. Um, so I know today all of us probably won't agree on everything. Some of us might not agree on much, but we're all here today because we believe that the current system for accessing birth control needs to be reformed. Um, so hopefully today in our time together, we'll kind of break through the partisan divide and start to arrive at some common ground bipartisan solutions for empowering women and improving access to contraception. So I'm gonna keep this short because I know we have a lot of knowledge on the panel today and I don't wanna take up all the time. Um, we're gonna go quickly to introductory remarks and then I'll ask a couple questions and then I'll give some chance for all of you to ask questions as well. So to kick things off, we'll start with my colleague, Courtney Jocelyn. She spearheads our birth control deregulation efforts at R Street and she'll tell you a little, about, a little bit about our work both federally and in the states. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, as Caroline mentioned, I'm Courtney Joslin, and I'm a Commercial Freedom Fellow at the Art Street Institute, um, and I lead our birth control deregulation initiative as well. So if you're unfamiliar with the Art Street Institute, uh, we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy research organization, and we believe in policy research uh, on both the national and state level that promotes free markets and limited and effective government. So given this, you may wonder how hormonal birth control fits into that uh, within our street's mission, but access to hormonal contraception, such as birth control pills, birth control injections, and birth control patches, um, it's a consumer freedom issue. So when you remove politics from this issue and simply look at the available medical and health uh, research out there, it becomes clear that while hormonal contraception, or birth control as it's commonly called, um, is legal and theoretically available, it's not always easy to come by for women in the United States. So, women seeking a birth control prescription in the United States face a number of hurdles to getting it, and it has become clear to us that these hurdles are largely unnecessary and overly burdensome. So, our state's efforts have focused on deregulating hormonal contraception both federally and on the state level. So, several states have made great progress in expanding access to birth control by allowing trained pharmacists to prescribe it. So far, 10 states plus the District of Columbia have enacted this pharmacy access model. <clears throat> and these states are Oregon, Washington, California, Utah, Tennessee, Maryland, New Mexico, New Hampshire, Hawaii, and Colorado. So allowing pharmacists to prescribe hormonal contraception has proven beneficial in many ways. The expansion, first of all, of the pharmacist's scope of practice in this manner allows them as medication experts to offer services that they are well equipped and educated to provide. So as you may know, a typical doctor's visit to get a birth control prescription usually includes a self-reported medical questionnaire that the patient fills out, a blood pressure test, and then a quick chat with your provider about which contraception you prefer to use. All of these are things that pharmacists can, and in some cases already do. So easing access to birth control can have a positive impact as well when it comes to supporting limited and effective government. And this is where our street likes to focus as well. So consider that nearly half of all pregnancies in the United States are unintended. This has negative outcomes, both with respect to the health of the mother, as well as uh, the public expenditure angle. So for example, in 2010 alone, federal and state governments spent over $21 billion combined on the medical costs associated with unintended pregnancies. So of that, state governments shouldered nearly $6.4 billion to cover the costs that are associated with unintended pregnancies. So pharmacy access, allowing pharmacists to prescribe birth control, could significantly reduce the amount of tax dollars spent on unintended pregnancies. So our street has been actively working in several states just this year to promote the pharmacy access model. Uh, states such as Illinois, Iowa, Massachusetts, South Carolina, Rhode Island, and Arkansas all have bills in progress that would allow pharmacists to prescribe birth control. And we've provided support uh, by way of either testimony or general education around the pharmacy access model in all of these states, and we will continue our efforts there. And hopefully as more states introduce pharmacy access bills, will be there. Um, so nationally, I just want to touch on this real quick, we've also worked with legislators to find support for uh, a federal 
bill that would urge the FDA to approve birth control for over-the-counter status. However, this is a much longer process. It involves a lot more moving parts. And this is something that Dr. Grossman can get into as well because he's been very involved with it. But that does require political support from both sides of the aisle. Um, but that's kind of where, where our shoot stands and what we do and what we've been working on when it comes to contraception access and how we view it as a limited government uh, priority. So thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Um, next, we'll turn to Dr. Dan Grossman. In addition to being a practicing OBGYN in San Francisco, Dr. Grossman also has a really extensive background in research focused on contraception access. He serves on committees for organizations like the American Public Health Association and the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. He's also a professor at UCSF and runs the Oral Contraceptives OTC Working Group. Dr. Grossman, can you give us an explanation of where the medical community stands on this? Um, sure, uh, and thanks for the invitation mm -hmm. to be a part of this. Uh, I, and just to say, I don't run the OC's OTC working group. I'm part of the steering committee, um, and really very happy to, to represent that group. Um, and I also just want to say uh, that I don't have any um, relevant financial relationships to disclose. I don't have any financial relationships to any pharmaceutical companies. But yeah, I'd like to say a few words about sort of what the scientific evidence is related to over-the-counter access to oral contraceptives. Um, and let me just kind of start with the conclusions. Uh, I really believe, looking at all this medical evidence, um, that OTC access to the pill is safe and effective, uh, and it would help women better control their fertility and help them better realize their reproductive intentions. Major medical and nursing groups um, are really pretty much universally in support of OTC access to the pill, and survey after survey indicates that women are really very interested in this model. It really just makes good medical sense to remove the prescription barrier to the birth control pill. I think, you know, a few years ago this would have sounded really pretty revolutionary here in the U.S., um, but the reality is that actually this is, this is really the norm in most of the world. So most of the world's female population has already access to the birth control pill without requiring a prescription. Um, some countries like China and India have actually officially made certain formulations of the pill available over the counter. Um, and in other places like most of the countries in Latin America, um, the pill is essentially de facto available in pharmacies without a prescription. So in an analysis that we did, 70% of the world's countries um, allow people to access birth control pills without a prescription. But of course, this is the US, and it's different here. Um, and for a pill to be approved for over-the-counter sale, it would need to be approved um, by the, um, the Food and Drug Administration to be sold without a prescription. And the FDA would focus on five main criteria um, in order to make that determination. And I'd like to quickly kind of go through those criteria, each one. So the first one um, is that the drug has no significant toxicity if overdosed. Um, and that's true for the pill. Um, you take a whole bunch of pills, might have a lot of nausea and vomiting, but it's not dangerous. Um, the second thing is that the drug um, can't be addictive, and that's also not true. Uh, I've heard sometimes from some of my patients that they kind of wish it were addictive, it might help them remember to take it, but um, it's not for this, for this formulation at least. Uh, the third criterion is that the users can self-diagnose the condition for appropriate use, and again, that's definitely true for the birth control pill. It's women themselves who determine whether they're at risk for an unintended pregnancy and need to be using contraception. Um, the last two are a little more complicated. So the fourth criterion is that users can safely take the medication without a clinician's screening. Um, or stated another way, um, can women figure out on their own whether the pill is appropriate for them or not? Uh, and there's really now quite a bit of evidence indicating that women can accurately use simple checklists in order to identify the short number of, the short list of contraindications, which are conditions or medications that might make um, taking the pill either a little less safe or less effective. Um, you know, in fact, when I screen as an OBGYN a patient who wants to start the pill, um, as Courtney said, it really is just a simple list of questions about medical history that I'm asking the patient. Um, there are no complicated <coughs> medical tests. The one thing, as Courtney mentioned, for, for if a patient wants a method that contains estrogen, it's important to have a blood pressure measurement to make sure she doesn't have hypertension. But again, you know, these days with blood pressure cuffs at grocery stores and, and drug stores, it's really very easy to do, to do on your own without going to the doctor. 
So then the fifth criterion that the FDA would consider um, is that users can take the medication as indicated without a clinician's explanation. Again, we also have research indicating that oral contraceptives <coughs> meet this criterion as well. I helped lead a study with colleagues at the University of Texas at Austin called the Border Contraceptive Access Study that was funded by NIH, um, where we followed about 500 women who were living in El Paso, Texas, near the border, who were crossing the border and getting their pills in um, pharmacies in Mexico without a prescription. And then we compared them to a similar group of 500 women who were living in El Paso, and about 40% said that they would be likely to actually use an OTC pill if one were available. Um, this included a little over half of women who are currently using the pill who said they were interested in using an OTC pill. But I think what's really interesting um, is that 38% of women who were using a method less effective than the pill, so like condoms alone, said that they would be likely to switch to using the pill if it were available without a prescription. Um, also, 23% of women who were using no method um, but were having sex and said they didn't want to be pregnant said that they would be likely to start using the pill if the pill were available without a prescription. Um, in that survey, interest in OTC pills was high across the board. There were no differences by age, by race, ethnicity, by education level, by area of the country where they lived, um, by income level. Uh, one important difference was, not surprisingly, women who didn't have health insurance were significantly more likely um, to say that they were interested in the OTC pill. So that's kind of my quick overview of uh, some of the medical and scientific evidence related to OTC access to the pill. I know some people have concerns, and I think we'll be talking about some of that during the, the discussion. Um, but I just want to end by highlighting again that almost every major medical and nursing organization, professional organization that works in the area of women's health has come out in support of OTC access to the pill. That includes ACOG, the American College of OBGYNs, the AMA, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the National Association of Nurse Practitioners in Women's Health, um, the American Nurses Association, uh, and the list goes on. Um, if you'd like any more information about any of this research, um, please feel free to come up afterwards. You can email me, you can look at the OC's OTC um, Working Group site online, or freethepill.org is our public facing website. Thank you so much. Next, we'll hear from Jamil Fields. Jamil works for the Planned Parenthood Federation of America, an organization which needs no introduction, and she's also an adjunct professor at the University of, Mar University of Maryland College of Law. Jamil? Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, so I'm Jamil Fields, as was mentioned. Um, so as you all know, Planned Parenthood is, one, is the largest provider of women's health care services uh, in the country, and we're proud to provide health care to a range of people, over 2 million uh, women, men, and uh, non-binary people. Uh, Planned Parenthood provides a range of preventive health services, which is why I was asked to be on the panel, including uh, contraceptives, obviously. And so uh, increasing access to contraceptives has been a core mission of Planned Parenthood's 100-year uh, history. Um, so uh, just stepping back, uh, just obviously uh, we all, uh, ha we have some agreement on the panel and there's some, some places where we disagree, but one place we can agree is on uh, the importance of birth control uh, and the access and access to it. So uh, birth control has both health and financial benefits. Uh, birth control is basic preventive health care service. Um, millions of women use it for a range of service, a range of benefits, um, deciding wh when and if to have children, um, but also uh, in managing endometriosis, migraines, menstrual pain, menstrual regulation, uh, et cetera. Uh, and in terms of financial security, uh, birth control has been uh, a, a, a focal uh, point for many women to be able to decide uh, if to have families, when to pursue their education, um, and allow men, women to pursue goals. Uh, over 80% of women state that birth control has a positive effect on, on their lives, and 77% of voters uh, from a, a range of political spectrums agree that men and uh, women, uh, economic security uh, ha has been improved by improved access to birth control. Uh, yet, yeah, while birth control, uh, uh, we don't think, should be a, a controversial topic and, uh, and it should be treated as any other health care service, not everyone receives the contraceptives uh, access that they, they need or would want. Um, and uh, there, that can, falls into two primary reasons why we think. Uh, not having reasonable access to a provider that provides a full range of birth control methods. 
Um, and our friends I see here from Power to Decide can tell you better than me that they have data that shows that 19 million women uh, remain without reasonable access to a health center that provides a full range of contraceptive access. Uh, and the second piece of that we think is affordability. Uh, and uh, in 2013, we commissioned a survey that showed that uh, women stated that they did not receive, women who stated they did not receive all the contraceptives they wanted or, or needed, um, over 50% of them said affordability was the reason why. Uh, and it's for that reason uh, Planned Parenthood uh, uh, supports efforts to expand uh, uh, birth control <coughs> access, and we think that must be coupled uh, also with uh, coverage access. Um, uh, I, I know we're here to talk about state efforts and so, but just putting it in a little context, I know you all uh, know I have to tell this room uh, that the Affordable Care Act requires a range of uh, most health plans to cover a full range of birth control options and over 63 million women um, have uh, uh, benefited from, from this uh, requirement uh, and we applaud that, uh, uh, but that doesn't mean that every woman has access to birth control method that she uh, she would like and so uh, for that reason we have worked and advocated along with some of our friends here uh, in the uh, states um, to increase uh, birth control uh, options um, so just I'll touch quickly because I know uh, interest of time and I'm happy to, to take some questions as well uh, but those laws and state laws fall among a, a range of topics um, so as Dan was mentioned, uh, increasing uh, over-the-counter access. And so there are at least four states as of January who require over-the-counter coverage without a prescription um, uh, for, for birth control. Um, and Planned Parenthood, as I said, supports over-the-counter access. Uh, we just think that access also has to be coupled with co coverage. Uh, we have plenty of data to show that uh, for many women, uh, paying out-of-pocket is just not reasonable for them. Uh, IUD can cost more than $1,000 uh, uh, for a woman, or a, a pack of uh, pills for annually can cost up to $600. Uh, and one in four women uh, who were on birth control have stated that they would have chosen a different method if they uh, were able to afford it. Um, so that's one category of state laws. Another uh, are contraceptive equity laws. Uh, so our friends at the National Health Law Program actually have a model uh, contraceptive equity bill, but the states that have adopted it have ranged in what the characteristics of those bills. So I'll just mention two of those characteristics, uh, requiring a full range of contraceptive coverage uh, with no cost sharing uh, to the consumer. <coughs> Uh, including uh, male <coughs> contraceptives uh, and removing the prescription drug re prescription requirement for over-the-counter coverage. Uh, and then there's another category of bills uh, requiring multi-month dispensing, so 12 month, uh, being able to access a 12-month supply of contraceptives, or some states have a six-month supply of contraceptives um, if, if uh, prescribed by, by a doctor. So uh, all to say, uh, there has been a lot of activity uh, in the states to increase uh, contraceptive access. That does not mean that there is not room for uh, the uh, federal government or, or Congress to take up the mantle and increase that access, and we think there's some lessons to be learned from the states. Thank you, Jamil. Next, we'll hear from Inez Stepman, who is a senior fellow with the Independent Women's Forum. And as I know you've spent most of your career working in center-right politics, why do you think Republicans should care about this issue, and what's kind of the conservative or free market case? Sure, um, and, and thanks to, to R Street for hosting this panel. It's, it's great to be on a, a panel um, in Washington that has so many different and divergent views, and I think actually even on this issue, we probably disagree with the implementation and how to do this. Uh, but I think we mostly agree that the current system puts up unnecessary barriers to women who are seeking um, to purchase birth control. So there is this narrative that Republicans oppose birth control, I think particularly stemming uh, from misunderstandings of the Hobby Lobby case and the disagreements in general over the HHS mandate and Obamacare. Uh, but that's actually just not the case. Uh, some conservatives and indeed some, some liberals uh, oppose the use of birth control morally or for religious reasons. Uh, but it is vanishingly rare uh, to, to, as you said, I've been right, working in center-right politics now for almost a decade, and I, don't, I have yet to meet somebody who uh, is against having birth control options available um, for women to make their own decisions about. 
So the question there is rather, um, how do we create a system that is uh, the easiest for the consumer, right? That implements competition to reduce cost and that doesn't trample moral consciences. So um, women being able to make their own decisions, I think, is, is a, a key element and theme of why Republicans, uh, many Republicans do support this kind of reform. Um, women should be able to make their own decisions about a drug like the pill uh, and not be slapped with unrelated requirements. And then often, for example, when they go into the doctor's office to get a pill prescription, they uh, have to complete, you know, probably good but unnecessary or unrelated tests, such as having a gynecological exam or a pap smear. Great things to do, but not, as the doctor mentioned, not actually directly related to whether or not somebody um, he, uh, is able to get a prescription or it's safe for them to, to use the pill. Um, so much like I think there has been a pushback in, in um, sort of right-leaning circles uh, against um, sort of cartel-like um, systems, for example, um, in, in other kind of licensing requirements and so on. Um, R Street does some great work on a whole variety of occupational licensing requirements or um, in the medical field, for example, uh, the, the requirement of if there's a legal requirement to go in and redo your, your prescription for glasses, for example, every year. Um, so, so some of these, these things, uh, I think, are part of the general reform of occupational licensing and consumer freedom. Uh, I think that that fits squarely into that plank of, of the conservative agenda. Um, and then some other reasons I think conservatives should support this. Um, so, I can't read my own handwriting, which is a free point. You'd think it would be, you'd think it'd be the doctor on the panel who could read his own handwriting. <laughs> um, so, I think, first of all, um, I think this is a much better way of solving this societal discussion. In fact, I'm not sure why this is really a public discussion at all over birth control. The reason it's become a public discussion, right? Um, is because uh, we have, one, an insurance system, and two, um, later with the passage of Obamacare, we have now created a, a public or, um, you know, sort of political component to this. It's not necessary, um, and it causes uh, cultural friction, right? Uh, the same folks that I mentioned in the beginning of my talk who might oppose birth control for moral reasons, um, they oppose paying for it themselves or being part of a system um, that distributes it or pays for it, um, and, and having this be a public, being a public conversation creates those kinds of culture clashes that I think are in some in some cases unnecessary. Um, so the second reason would be to that moving birth control into a pharmacy access model or over the counter um, might create some downward pressure on costs. Right, we have a general problem in the healthcare system which is that a third party, as long as you have a third party payer for things that are, are routine, um, there is always going to be an inflationary aspect to that, right? Um, there's, a, there's a reason that most people do not purchase maintenance insurance for their cars. Uh, that's because you're gonna be paying the co average cost of maintenance plus the overhead plus the profit. Um, and oftentimes that's not a particularly good deal for the consumer. Birth control falls exactly into that kind of category where it's predictable, it's voluntary, it's fairly routine. Um, these, are not, these are things that we should be looking to move actually outside of the insurance system where somebody else is paying for them and introduce them to a real transparent cost competition, which unfortunately is, is very rare in our medical system to actually know what anything costs, right? Because we have this insurance model that hides hides you know, costs even hospital to hospital, doctor to doctor. There's not a lot of way for, for mm -hmm. consumers to actually compare the costs of um, a lot of medical procedures or, or drugs, we could alleviate some of that by at least moving some of these things over the counter, some of um, birth control options over the counter, even if some percentage is still paid for by insurance. Um, so we have, we have a, actually a, a, an example of this when Claritin moved from being a prescription only medication to being over the counter, uh, the cost very quickly dropped to 50%. Um, so if we're talking about the ability of, of women who are lower income to be able to access uh, and be able to afford birth control options, having that downward pressure on the price um, could be a very good thing. 
It also could um, actually open up access or make things easier for a lot of women who do not live particularly close to a doctor and for whom it's difficult to um, make those annual appointments, for example, just to get the prescription of birth control. Um, a lot of rural women, they might be driving 25 miles, 50 miles, 60 miles, um, you know, or more to be able to get to the doctor. But 90% um, of Americans live within two miles of a pharmacy. So this could, could really be a, a great convenience driver for a lot of those women. And furthermore, I, I think that, uh, as, as our street has pointed out, uh, this, is, this is a good model for where the states can actually, it's a model of federalism, right? We have states uh, with competing models and, and vastly different, actually, political makeup, right? California and Utah, Hawaii and Tennessee, we don't usually put these, these states in the same camp. All of them are experimenting with different models, whether that's the pharmacy access model, or just plain over the counter. Um, they're experimenting with different ways of doing this, and I think that that's absolutely the way that our system should work, right? These states are, are going out, they're, they're um, trying something new that could have the potential to, to increase access greatly um, for women, and, and we'll see those models spread and change and adjust as we, we see any problems that arise with them. So I think that's actually a good model of federalism. Um, to, I'm sure the doctor can speak much more uh, effectively to the safety of this than I can. Um, I'm actually, I, I actually think that we need to talk more about the side effects of hormonal birth control um, and the very severe side effects for, for some women. Um, but it's not clear to me that, that having, uh, forcing women to get a prescription in order to get birth control is actually alleviating uh, many of those concerns about the side effects. Birth control is still an incredibly common medication uh, for women to use, and, and women you know, talk to each other about um, sort of what method might work or what, what uh, form of the pill, for example, with different you know, levels of, of two, the two different hormones involved might work better for them. It's not clear to me that uh, that prescription barrier is actually advancing those conversations in any way. Um, and furthermore, it's, it's a little bit, um, it, it doesn't fit well together with the idea that Plan B is already um, over the counter, which is a higher dosage of all of those hormones. Um, it doesn't really make a lot of sense as uh, <coughs> my uh, fellow uh, at IWF, Hadley Manning, who I'm replacing today, um, says it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to have plan B be over the counter, but to have plan A be behind the prescription barrier, right? Um, so I guess just to sum up, uh, I think that having this over the counter access or prescription access, I mean, pharmacy access model could, could actually calm some of the tensions in the culture war. As we push more and more things um, into either, you know, nationalization via the federal government or, um, you know, in general, into the political arena, there's there's more and more opportunities for friction between Americans of different beliefs, or good faith Americans of different beliefs. This is one way in which we can remove something that uh, you know sets us at each other's throats um, as as Americans, uh, and and at the same time give more access to women, uh, create a downward pressure on some of the prices. Um, and, uh, and, and ensure that birth control decisions are, in fact, a woman's choice and also a woman's responsibility. Thank you. I'll ask a couple of questions of the panelists before I open it up to you guys. I guess the first question I have, a critique you hear from a lot of people, which you touched on in, in your intro, Dr. Grossman, is that if women don't go to their doctor to get their birth control prescription, then they won't be having their regular visits to you know, screen for their sexual health, screen for intimate partner violence, and all of those things. So how do you ensure if birth control is available without a prescription that women will still get the care that they need? You know, touched on this, that these are all really important services that are separate from the prescription of hormonal birth control. And we shouldn't be holding women's birth control hostage and essentially force them to come in to get these other th services that we think is important um, just because they want to get, get the pill. Um, I, you know, we have some research from our study that I mentioned in El Paso where we looked at um, those two groups of women, the women who were getting pills over the counter and the ones who were getting pills in clinics, and asked if they had had the recommended preventive screening, like had they had a pap smear in the past three years, had they gotten, depending on their age, they'd gotten screened for sexually transmitted infections. 
And what we found was, yes, you know, the screening was universal among those who were getting their care in clinics, getting their pills in clinics, but it was also very high, in fact, higher than the national average um, for the women who were getting their, their pills over the counter because these women understood that this was an important thing for them to do and they figured out a way to, to get it. But, you know, when we asked those women who hadn't gotten the recent pap smear, what was the reason? It was often the same reasons that they were choosing to get their pills over the counter because of the cost barrier to find a place where they could to get a pap smear in El Paso, things like that. So um, I don't think it makes sense to, to hold these things hostage. I think it will be important when the pill, it, when the pill does go over the counter um, to pair it with um, an informational campaign, make sure people are aware of how frequently they should get screened for sexually transmitted infections, for cervical cancer, for things like that, and to let them know where they can get those separate but important services. Jamil, do you have anything to add on that? No, I think Dan hit it, hit it right. Um, I mean, the only thing I'll add is, I mean, in short, it's just we have to trust women and other people to make good decisions. You know, women have been making healthcare decisions and family decisions and all other types of decisions for a very long time. Um, as, as Dan mentioned, we of course want to make sure people are equipped to make those decisions and making sure that uh, people have the access that they can to be able to go to uh, access a range of services, including their well woman visits, HI, HIV testing and screening. And uh, part of that goes to the first point I mentioned about making sure that people have access to a provider uh, uh, and, and can afford to get to that provider and also that they don't have to travel an unreasonable amount of time and distance to get to a provider where they have access to those range of services. I think that proves to be more of a barrier than saying, well, you have to come in in order to get, get your birth control in order to, to get, get uh, and to, so we can ensure you get those services. Um, so a couple of you have touched on the difficulty of women in rural areas to sometimes make a doctor's visit. I know telemedicine has been a really important advent in a lot of different healthcare scenarios. Um, maybe, Courtney, I'll give this one to you. Do you want to touch on the role of telemedicine in expanding access to contraception? Sure. So that's another uh, big aspect of this question as well. And, you know, a lot of times when people are talking about the birth control issue, you hear, well, you know, if someone believes someone, a woman should go to a doctor, well, there, there are very good estimates out there that a woman may not be able to access a doctor in the next 15 to 20 years. We are facing a physician and specialist physician uh, shortage um, in the United States. I read recently the estimate is by, I believe, 2030 that there should be, or there's going to be a, a shortage of around 120,000 uh, healthcare providers, and this includes OBGYNs. Um, so, you know, op opening access through other health professionals is going to become even more necessary than it is now as women are less able to access a doctor because they can't, they simply can't find one. Um, so that's where telemedicine also comes in. If you're able to get a birth control prescription as you can from some uh, telemedicine companies currently, um, that's going to greatly increase your access and it's going to increase the chance that a woman can continue her preferred method um, as, she go, as she goes through her life. So for example, um, if a student go, or if a high school student goes to college and she's been on birth control, she's moving to a new town, she may not know where to access it. You know, she may have access uh, to a clinic, but maybe she needs a regular healthcare provider. Maybe she doesn't know who to reach out to, whether or not she's still on her parents' insurance, those sorts of things. If she's getting a prescription from a telemedicine company, it's inter uninterrupted. All she has to do is change her address and assuming that the state she lives in uh, still allows her to be prescribed from a doctor online, then she can continue her preferred method um, with no interruptions, which is which is great for uh, the future of healthcare. And so it's not it's become a question of not um, if telemedicine is going to become a priority, but when. And so we're seeing this in a, a like all kinds of different things. As Inez mentioned, we've talked about um, getting contact lens prescriptions and glasses prescriptions online, and these are battles that are happening in the, on the state level. Um, as well as on the federal level. And so allowing birth control to be prescribed, especially the birth control pill, um, online is going to become a huge uh, important factor on whether or not a woman can access this. So it's, it's sort of, you know, to take a 30,000 foot view of it, it's, it's very piecemeal reform in order to have, to allow women to have more options. So, and that's again where we come in with the consumer freedom aspect because it's important for a woman to be able to choose whether she wants to go see a specialist or she wants to go to a pharmacist to get a birth control prescription or she wants to go online. Increasing all these different options is going to increase the likelihood that women are able to get what they want 
um, in a safe and effective manner. Yeah. Something else about telemedicine. Um, I mean, I think these are, this is another great um, model, and we, with colleagues at Ibis Reproductive Health, recently um, conducted a study uh, where we looked at the screening practices of these common telehealth platforms like Nurex, um, Lemonade, there are a whole bunch of them, um, and found that they are generally using evidence-based criteria to screen patients who are trying to access birth control pills um, or sometimes other hormonal methods through the sites. Um, their numbers are really going up uh, rapidly, and I think we're going to see rapid expansion uh, of these models. There are still some barriers in some states, um, barriers around the use of asynchronous telemedicine um, that has made it hard for the, some of these platforms to expand in, in a few states, and I think that is one area where policy reform could help with that expansion. And just to clarify what Dr. Grossman, so the asynchronous telemedicine issue is an issue um, where you're not live with the doctor. So basically you're not Skyping with the doctor. You're sending in your information for, in this case, for birth control prescriptions, you're sending in you know, answers to questions, and then a doctor can separately at a different time review the information and give you a prescription. So that's why it's called the asynchronous uh, telemedicine is because you're not face-to-face -face on, on a screen with the doctor. And so that's where we run into a lot of uh, barriers in the states that don't allow for asynchronous currently. Thank you. Um, so most of our discussion so far has focused on the pill and over-the-counter status, but obviously the longer-acting forms of birth control are the preferred choice by many women. How do you guys think that we can expand access to those forms that may not be suitable for, you know, a pharmacist's prescription? Um, Jamil, do you want to kick that off? Sure. Um, so like I mentioned, um, uh, the various sort of state laws that I mentioned, um, uh, uh, most most of them for, will expand access to uh, a the full range of contraceptives, including uh, IUDs, patches, uh, and and we believe that women should be able to make a decision about what it what are the best option for her. Um, so, like you mentioned, long acting reversible contraceptives are the most effective, but that might not be the best option for every woman. And so, uh, there could be uh, you know she might sh choose to be be on the pill. So, uh, we think that coverage should include the full range, so that a woman is. Able able to make make that choice and make that decision uh, for herself and if there are is coverage um, for uh, larks then that should also include uh, coverage of removal as, as well anything to add and just to say that unfortunately my colleagues in uh, medical professionals are I think still some of the barriers to improving access to these long-acting reversible methods like the IUD implants um, I mean uh, you know, there's a lot of evidence showing that um, these methods are very appropriate for, for young people, for, even for adolescents, for women who haven't had uh, a, a child before, um, and there's still physicians who are reticent to, to provide these methods for those patients. Um, there's a lot of evidence that these are great methods to provide right after a pregnancy ends, either after a delivery or after an abortion or after a miscarriage. Sometimes there are issues related to coverage that are the barrier, and sometimes it's related to the fact that the type of provider that has difficulty getting the method, sometimes it's just that the provider isn't aware that it's an appropriate time to use these methods. So I still think that there's more that could be done with um, physician and clinician education and training around this. Another interesting sticking point that seems to come up is the issue of age, and this is an issue where I can kind of see both sides, you know. Um, in, on one hand, those under 18 are the most who, who really have the most to lose from an unplanned pre pregnancy, but on the other hand, especially in Republican states, it tends to be more of a lift to get that type of bill across the finish line, and you know, a bill that improves access for adults is better than one that improves access for none. Um, how would you guys respond to the age issue? Do you think that it should apply, that over-the-counter status should apply to women of all ages or just adults? Um, Inez, do you have thoughts on that? Uh, well, I tend to think that, that parents are still uh, very much a part of this, should very much be a part of this. I'm reluctant to support laws that allow um, allow minors to circumvent their parents. Um, that being said, I think an easy way to, to deal with this might be whatever the current, uh, because uh, Plan B is over the counter, um, one of the ways might be to just peg it. I think in some states it's either 16 or 17. Um, it's not, it's all 18? There's, yeah, there's, no, there's no age restriction anymore. There is no age restriction anymore. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm uncomfortable with the idea, and I know I know the arguments on the other side that 
um, you know, that it's better for adolescents who are having sex to be have access to these things. Um, but I, I am generally uncomfortable with any institution coming between a child and his parents or her parents. Um, and, and so I, I, I would feel much more comfortable supporting these laws if there's some kind of age restriction in place, either 18 or at least something like you know, 16, 17. Anyone want to respond on the other side? Oh, Bravo, Jill. Yeah, Kirk, Kirk, Kirk has his hand. <laughs> <laughs> Um, from medical perspective, if we wanted to make an evidence-based age restriction for over-the-counter pills, we'd say that it's over-the-counter for everyone under age 35, and if you're over 35, you got to get a prescription. Uh, and then we'd see older women asking their kids to try to get their pills for them, because it's really the older women that actually are more likely to have a medical contraindication. The smokers have high blood pressure. Those are the people that actually, uh, for whom you know, it might be a little more dangerous to have OTC access to the pill. The, um, these contraindications, these medical conditions that might make it you know, more concerning to have OTC access to the pill are almost non-existent among adolescents. So there's really no medical concern. Um, there's a lot of research around emergency contraception that has shown that improving access to contraception for teens doesn't improve, doesn't increase sexual risk taking. So. It, it makes it easier for teens who are having sex to access those methods. And we do know that at first sex, teens are much more likely to use an over-the-counter method like condoms um, uh, if they're going to use a contraceptive method at all. So I really see it as, uh, I think it's critically important, that, at least from a medical perspective, that we work to make sure that there is no age restriction for future OTC pills. We also know from research that teens are very interested in having access to an OTC pill. Um, in that national survey that we did, we also included a sample of uh, teens aged 15 to 17, uh, and about 30% said that they would be likely to use the pill um, if, if one were available. <clears throat> and that was particularly true for those that were already sexually active. Um, among, uh, there was another study that was done among abortion patients. Uh, and uh, again, among the teens, among the 15 to 17 year olds, um, there was very high access, about half of them said they were very likely to use an OTC pill if one were available. So I think this is really an important uh, strategy to help improve access to more effective contraception for this population. I, I think too, maybe just sort of, sort of reconcile um, <coughs> some of the concerns around the age thing. So this is happening a lot in the pharmacy access model in the states. Some states require um, a patient to be 18 or above to get a prescription from a pharmacist. Some don't have any age restrictions. Um, Tennessee has a, a strange little carve out that if you're an emancipated minor, then you can still get a, a birth control prescription from a pharmacist. And the concerns that I've heard from policymakers on the age thing is exactly that. Do, do we want a 13 year old going into a pharmacy and getting a birth control prescription? Um, and part of that concern is, is that patient even old enough to know her medical history and able to provide a self-reported medical questionnaire, um, or is she going to lie about it? And really, the, the thing that pharmacists have responded with is patients already do that. Um, this isn't going to open the floodgates for, you know, for children to lie about their medical history or whatever it may be. Um, it's just simply going to be an access issue again. So there's... There's a lot of hesitation from policymakers on the age issue, but when you view it sort of more holistically, then you begin to understand it's not as, um, maybe not as controversial as it sounds at first blush. And it is sort of a neat, you know, when we talk about contraception in general, there are a lot of sort of uh, like knee-jerk instincts that we all have about where we fall. Um, so it's really interesting to view it from the pharmacist's perspective, at least in that model, that, you know, this is already happening, um, and then, you know, if, it's, if there's an age restriction for 18, a 17 year old is likely to be friends with an 18 year old, she's going to go in and get it for her. So, you know, it's that same thing. There's always going to find, humans find ways to respond to the incentives and the barriers put in front of them. Yeah, when I think about, I know you touched on this a lot in your introductory remarks, that there is kind of this sense that talking about contraception is taboo, which, as we mentioned, is so ridiculous because it is so widely used. Um, Inez, do you want to touch on that a little more? Why is it that you think Republicans have this reputation of being hesitant to talk about contraception? And do you think that'll change anytime soon? I, I don't know. 
that I agree with the premise. Um, I don't think Republicans are reluctant to talk about contraception. I think they just view it as a personal responsibility um, rather than a, the, than a public or political issue. Um, I mean, I, I think in general, regardless of the politics, we haven't done a good job of, of um, especially since this medication is so widely used between, you know, basically the ages of 16 and, and um, you know, 35. Um, it's so widely used and so commonly used, we haven't done a good job of talking about the side effects. Um, and I say this as somebody who has no moral qualms whatsoever with birth control. Um, I think we haven't, um, you know, we haven't talked a lot about the fact that, that many, many women do experience serious side effects. Not, you know, um, not that there are fortunately no longer very, it's not common, of course, to, you know, have something fatal or, or really, really serious that would land you in the hospital, but many women live with day in, day out, many um, extremely uncomfortable side effects and, and um, things that are, are not, uh, not ideal. Um, and, but, but this doesn't stop anyone, right, from going to have those conversations with their doctor. It doesn't stop them from having those conversations with a pharmacist who, in many cases, might actually be more intimately familiar with the long list of potential side effects, whereas a doctor who's moving to the next patient um, might not have the time or inclination to go through the, you know, more very, very long insert of, of potential consequences and just, you know, sort of hit the most common, right? Um, so I'm, it's not clear to me that putting those things behind a prescription barrier or a doctor's office barrier is actually advancing those conversations. I'm very, I, I think that it's really important that we have them. And I'm, I think across the board, regardless of politics, I think this is just a conversation that we ha need to have more um, about you know, the different methods of birth control and about um, the, the potential side effects uh, that hormones can have for many women um, but I just, I don't see this barrier as really solving that problem or advancing that conversation. I think that's something we're going to have to do culturally. We're going to have to, to advance that conversation, uh, regardless of whether they're in the doctor's office or in the pharmacy or over the counter. And I just don't think that the current system is actually, you know, helping that in any way. So I'll just say, and I'll, I'll let Dan, because he's the one with the MD, MD talk more of, of our thoughts about uh, side effects. But, you know, birth control, we can't agree on the premise that birth control is basic health care and should be treated as such. Um, I think there are uh, uh, a few, probably maybe, prescriptions that I could think of that, that wet might not have any p potential for, for side effects. But birth control has long been used. It's safe. Uh, it, it, it is a, a, a effective. Uh, and so it should be a part of the conversation of any as we have for any other health care service. Uh, and that means that there should be access for it as well uh, and that people should be able to make, uh, have the ability to make informed decisions about the, uh, the full range of their health care uh, options, including contraceptives. And so on that, on that <laughs> premise, I think, think we can agree on that. I mean, just quickly, I, I, I mean, I agree with Ines that I, it's, um, it's true that certainly some of my patients do have um, side effects on birth control and it can be hard for them to find the best method for them. Luckily, we have do have more options and there's an option of a non-hormonal <coughs> IUD, for example, that can last for as long as 12 years or even longer. Um, but I do think we need more options and um, there is some exciting, promising research about even totally new <laughs> strategies that are not hormonal based to, to um, for new contraceptive methods, including some promising methods for men that are like way long overdue for that. Um, but I don't think that we can expect, I mean, this issue has been really deprioritized uh, at, um, in the pharmaceutical industry. I don't think pharma is going to be uh, investing a lot in this because they don't see the possibility for a blockbuster drug in contraception. And this is a place where we need the federal government to actually step up and um, increase funding through NIH, I think, for women's health generally, but specifically for um, more research on contraception, because I agree with you. I think we need new options for people. Are there any questions from the audience back there? And can you please yeah. uh, introduce yourself? I'm Nisa I work for Senator Lee. So one of the things we work on is parental rights, and I'll be honest, that discussion of AIDS is extraordinary. Um, just clearing that in some, some states, many states, kids can't even consent to having sex with people until they're 16. Um, a discussion about children's, basically children, 13 as a child, access to contraception. Um, I think the question I have, and I agree with Ines, um, is it reasonable 
much respect conservatives to support something that would give children access to contraception without any parental involvement. Would anyone like to respond? I'll just say from a, a, my perspective comes from, um, similar as Dan mentioned, an evidence-based perspective. Our perspective comes from a public health perspective, which is one where we think that people should, uh, young people, uh, so both adolescents, young adults, should be able to make decisions and go in and get the health care that they, that they need in order to make responsible decisions. And so if a young person is engaged in sex, we want them to be able to go and to uh, get contraceptives and to uh, prevent pregnancy if, if that, that is sort of uh, 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 their, their choice. And so for that reason, we do think that uh, parental involvement should be encouraged, but it should not be a requirement uh, in order to ac access contraceptives. Uh, I would say that parental rights are paramount here. Um, you know, look, people raise their kids in all kinds of ways. Um, that others of us may not agree with. I mean, a thousand different ways, including medical decisions, right? Including all other medical decisions. Um, and I don't see any reason for this to be for to be different, that just because some parents might do this in a way with which uh, some folks disagree uh, or, or teach their children values that are different from some other folks, um, that, that we should actually encourage children to go around their parents. And I do see this as as a problem. Um, I actually have kind of a personal story about this. Um, I went on a pill when I was probably 14 or 15, uh, one of the few people. I was actually going on it for sort of other other unrelated, I was not sexually active, I just went on for other unrelated reasons, um, medical reasons. But, uh, you know, my parents got extremely angry because in the doctor's office, right, uh, my doctor insisted on seeing me alone and then asked me a series of questions about sexual activity um, and then encouraged me, you know, to, to get this prescription, which I, I had come in for. Um, my parents were not, not pleased by that. They had literally taken me there to get a prescription for birth control for non-sex related reasons, but they found that conversation to be inappropriate. Um, and I think it's it's perfectly reasonable um, for parents that feel that way. And, and I agree. I, I mean, look, this is one of the things that actually we do have a panel that disagrees. And we're going to come at this from incredibly different perspectives. Um, and I think, as you mentioned, there's no reason for us to disagree about access that adult women have. Um, and we can continue fighting about, about the rest. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, a couple things. One, um, you know, it's interesting. And we, we published a paper where we did a, a national survey of adult women and asked what they thought about this idea about an age restriction, whether they thought there should be an age restriction for a future OTC pill. And only about a quarter of adult women thought that there should be. And the rest either didn't think there should be or thought they needed more information. And specifically, information about whether uh, this OTC pill was safe and how a teen would, would access it and things like that. I think it's also important, um, you know, instead of just making these assumptions about what example, your constituents are want and um, uh, and what their perspective is. I think it would be also interesting to understand what's happening currently in the in your state around emergency contraception. As we just learned, emergency contraception is available over the counter now without an age restriction, and like the sky hasn't fallen. And actually, teen pregnancy continues to go down, um, and we're not hearing you know it, it hasn't been a, a big problem. And most teens do continue to talk to their parents about these sensitive issues. But for the small number and, or, that can't or, or don't, they still have good access to at least emergency contraception. And I would say they need access to, to all forms of contraception. I, I was just going to uh, chime in on, on something Dan mentioned that made me remember. You know, teen pregnancy rate is actually as all time low and uh, that is uh, largely or majority or probably wholly uh, a contri contribu contribution to uh, access to contraceptives. Uh, and so we do think, as I mentioned, that the public health uh, balance weighs in uh, making sure that adolescents and people of all ages are able to access uh, contraceptives because we know that the alternative uh, is that many will choose to not if they have to go uh, to get their parents' consent, 
uh, then they will just choose to just not uh, access contraceptives. And that does not mean that they won't have sex. It just means that they won't access contraceptives. I think we have another question. Just, just kind of, I'm not going to restart this, yeah. this debate or anything. I just uh, wanted to throw out one, one thing. Um, the idea that, that, so teen pregnancy is going down. Much like crime rates, there are, it's really, really difficult to suss out why that is, and there might be a lot of act, other factors because it's gone down even since access to the pill has become relatively widespread. So um, there are, might be a lot of reasons for that. Sure. Stay here. Hi, uh, I'm Mara Gandel Powers with the National Women's Law Center. My question's for Inez in particular around um, DC and, and what the experience there going over the counters. And I really appreciate the Claritin comparison because I think there's a lot of lessons learned there. But I think we do still see Plan B at a $50 price point and the generics that have come out at a basically a $40 price point. So I'm curious if you've looked into that at all and have any comparators to the future over the counter pill. Um, my, I, I guess. The information I would need to answer your question that maybe somebody else on the panel knows uh, would be what, what the cost of emergency contraception was if, if it was ever under prescription. I don't remember it ever being, at least from when I was like, you know, 16, 17, I don't remember it ever being under prescription, but yes, expensive. It was, and it was a bit more, but not, uh, I mean, I don't know, maybe $60 or something like that. I don't know exactly what the price was. I, I also would add there's a lot of competition within the, the pill right um, market there are a lot of different brands and different types of, of hormonal birth control so that helps if, if several of these end up over the counter then you're you're looking at an actual price shopping or value comparison which almost never happens in our medical system um, and and so other other services that have been outside the insurance system we also see this trend of going down over time like LASIK for example um, and so I think the more options there are, especially for more routine or, or consistent things that are outside of the current, I think you know, nobody agrees on, on uh, what we should do about our healthcare system, but everyone agrees that the current system is a mess. So um, I think the more options we can place outside of that system, um, the more likely we are to have price competition and prices going down too. We'll take one more question uh, over there. Hi, uh, my name is Eliza. I work for Senator Verona. Um, and I have also have a question for Inez. Um, so you talked a lot about how uh, competition between brands will drive down price point, which is a pretty standard um, concept. But my question is more kind of that oftentimes takes time um, for competition to drive down price. And for lower income women, that's not really time that they have to wait for price to go down if they don't have access to insurance or they don't have access to um, cheaper birth control. So I guess my question is like, how do you kind of reconcile that for poorer women and low-income women who don't have the time to wait for prices to go down if they don't have access to it already? So first of all, this can be implemented, you know, without changing anything about the current system. This is a kind of a separate issue. But I would say actually putting um, birth control over the counter that actually gives because even if it's if it's pricey, which I mean we already know, I I bought my birth control off insurance uh, for a long time until Obamacare removed my ability to have low-cost insurance that wouldn't cover it, at which point the premiums went up so far I had to drop my insurance. Um, so I, I think birth control, there are already several options. So I, I know because I was buying it for $19.99 at, at Rite Aid. Um, so I, I see this as an additional option. We can have a separate conversation about how to expand coverage, how to expand actual access as opposed to insurance coverage. Those are all sort of um, larger systemic conversations. But I see actually this particular proposal of putting more things in the pharmacy, more birth control options in the pharmacy model, it actually gives access to, to those women who do not have health insurance now because it is certainly cheaper to go to the pharmacy and purchase an over-the-counter um, over the counter pill than it is to go to the doctor without insurance to pay for the entire um, doctor's visit and for the prescription on top of that without insurance. It is certainly cheaper to just go to the pharmacy. So this is, I'll just chime in and say, this is why we support efforts to uh, have access to contraceptives over the counter, but we think that cannot happen without also coupling that with, with coverage uh, in order to translate this uh, sort of uh, advancement into actual access for people. So I'll say at Planned Parenthood, the, the 
majority of patients that we see would fall in the low to moderate income range, more, more so in the low income range. And we've done a number of studies that show that there are some people, including um, uh, uh, some people who can't afford even a $10 uh, out-of-pocket cost. So one st study showed that four out of 10, specifically black women, couldn't afford even a $10 copay. Uh, and um, so that's the reason why we do support efforts like uh, the ACA of requiring um, coverage without cost sharing. And we think that any over-the-counter move would need to be uh, coupled with that as well. I also, I don't see, you know, when we're talking about going over the counter, I don't see this crowding out the ability for clinics and community areas to, to provide low-cost birth control as well. Um, I don't see why that would have to, it's more of a, a uh, complement rather than a substitute in some cases. So again, if it's just about expanding the number of options that a woman has in terms of who she gets a prescription or her pill from, that's going to be, you know, a win-win. That's going to create uh, more equity for her in a lot of cases. So again, I don't think that it's an either or. It's, you know, if a woman is unable to afford the over-the-counter price, given, you know, the amount of, of infrastructure that we do already have in this country when it comes to accessing it through, uh, whether it's through local health clinic or health department, that I don't see that crowding that out at all. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time, but I want to thank you all for coming. Thanks again to our panelists. Hopefully, they'll be able to stick around if any of you have any questions. And if you'd like to be put in touch with any of them, feel free to email me, and I'll pass it on. Thank you.